Hello and welcome to this, our final video in the series that we've been doing looking at Scotland's reformations. Now when we left off the last time, it looked like the, the Covenanters were finished in Scotland uh, after their defeat at Bodwell Bridge. And it's true that that battle was a, a major disaster. But there was a faithful remnant who remained and continued in the faith. Two months after Bodwell, the, the Reverend Richard Cameron uh, returns to Scotland. He had been ordained over in Holland. Uh, but on his return, he finds that there's no there's no conventicles taking place, no field meetings. The other ministers just feel that it's too dangerous to do so. But Cameron sees and he knows that the preaching of God's word is of the utmost importance. So despite the danger, he preaches at conventicles in the southwest of Scotland. Now this is enough to, to put a, 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 a price on his head, but there's a, a, an event that would put a, a massive amount of money on his head. Because on the first anniversary of Bodwell Bridge, Cameron uh, and around 20 of his supporters, known as Cameronians, ride into the town of Sanker and read out a declaration in which they disown Charles II, who they say has been, been tyrannising the true church in Scotland. And they even declare war on the king, calling him a, a tyrant and a usurper. And they speak out against his successor, um, Charles' Roman Catholic brother, James Duke of York. The government place 5,000 mercs on his head, which is a massive amount of money. And there's financial rewards for the capture of his brother and some of his supporters as well. Four weeks after Sanka, uh, government troops eventually catch up with Richard and around 60 of his followers at a place called Airds Moss near Muir Kick. And despite defending themselves bravely, they are eventually overpowered. Um, Richard, his brother Michael and several others are killed. Richard's head and his hands are taken from his body, taken through to Edinburgh and shown to his father, first of all, who are in, who's in prison there and then placed on spikes above one of the entrances into the city. Now, with the death of Richard Cameron, um, there's, there's only one field preacher left in Scotland and his name is Donald Cargill, the Reverend Donald Cargill. Now, he's a friend of Cameron's and he actually preaches at Richard Cameron's funeral service uh, five days after his death at a, at a remote location called Starryshaw. The following month, he holds a, a huge conventicle in um, Torwood in Stirlingshire. And at this service, he excommunicates the king, Charles II, which is the, the highest punishment uh, in the church. He also excommunicates uh, his brother, uh, Charles' his brother, James Duke of York, the future king, and he excommunicates, excommunicates others who are persecuting the Presbyterians in Scotland as well. becomes known as the Torwood Excommunication. Now this makes the government even more determined to get their hands on, on cargo. And like Cameron, a price of 5,000 mercs is placed on his head. Donald Cargill has a few narrow escapes um, over the next um, a short while, uh, but he is eventually captured on the 11th of July 1681 at Covington Mill near Lanark, and he is, is taken through to Edinburgh and mar uh, martyred at the Market Cross on the 27th of July 1681. But his strength of faith and his calmness before his execution has a huge impact on those who are watching, and one of those um, who it has the most impact on is an 18-year-old teenager by the name of James Rennick. Now, after Richard Cameron's death, the, the church had organised themselves into societies and they had moved more underground for, for safety. Um, they became known as, as society people. Uh, and young James Rennick, he was determined to, to join the, the society people. The, the first society meeting was held at a place called Logan House, a farmhouse near Les Mahago on the, the December 15th, 1681. James Rennick is at that meeting and it's decided that they were going to publish a declaration at the Cross of Lanark, um, where they would repeat their adherence to the Rutherglen Declaration, the Sankar Declaration, and air other grievances against the King and Acts of Parliament as well. So, on the 18th of January, 1682, James Rennick and around 60 
men ride into Lanark, read out the declaration and burn a copy of the Test Act. Now, the Test Act um, had recently been introduced and everyone in public office had to take the, this test. And in it, it said that the king had supreme authority over all, all persons and all causes, including the church. It also renounced the National Covenant, the Solemn Leaguing Covenant, and when you took it, you had to promise not to change, uh, to try and change the government, either either the, in the state or in the church. So Covenanters couldn't take it. It was hated and a copy of it was burnt. Not long after this, the societies sent James Rennick over to Holland to train for the minister, to become their minister. Now, whilst he was away, the Covenanter societies continued to meet and they're growing numerically. There's several thousand people in them. And one of the, the main men who are tasked who's tasked to, to deal with the Covenanters was James Graham of Claverhouse. Now you may remember him from the Battle of Drumclog. He earned the nickname Bloody Clavers for his ruthlessness in pursuing the Covenanters. He and his dragoons would, would, would scour the countryside um, trying to find these Covenanter meetings and um, he spent his time just, just pursuing the Covenanters ruthlessly. Another part of his job was also to make sure that Covenanters were, or local people, were attending the local church and listening to the King's curates on, on Sundays. Uh, part of a report which was sent to the Privy Council in 1683, I think it was from Dumfries and Galloway, describes how Claverhouse would do this. And I'll read part of the, the, the this report. It says that he ordered the collectors of every parish um, to bring in exact rolls upon oath and attested by the minister and caused them to be read uh, every Sunday after the first sermon and mark those absent who were severely punished if obstinate. And whenever or whenever he heard of a, a parish that was considerably behind, he went there on Saturday and whoever was absent on Sunday, he punished on the Monday. Uh, the report also goes on to say that, that whilst pursuing um, the Covenanters, causing many of them to, to, to flee, um, he would rifle their houses, ruin their goods and imprison their servants so that their wives and their children um, were brought to starvation. And it was against this, this scene of growing persecution that the newly ordained Reverend Richard, uh, sorry, Reverend James Rennick returns to Scotland in 1683. In 1684, Rennick and the societies write an apologetical declaration where they say that, that anyone who continues to persecute them would be punished as theirs and God's enemies. Uh, the government also issued uh, a, a, an order after that stating that uh, anyone who refused to disown that declaration could be shot on the spot. Um, and with that, we, we now enter a period of Scotland's history with uh, the, 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 um, the grim name of the Killing Times. In February 1685, Charles II dies and his Roman Catholic brother, James VII, or the Second of England, becomes king. And he begins to, to relax, relax the rules on Roman Catholics, promoting several of them to, to prominent positions in the military and political positions as well. Rennick and the Covenanters write a second Sankar Declaration where they reject James VII's right to be king. Um, James VII, you'll remember, was one of those who Donald Cargill had excommunicated at Torwood as well. But meanwhile, for the faithful Covenanters, the, the persecution continues and it gets more violent during this killing times. And this is where we hear of some of the, the more well-known Covenanter martyr stories, like, like John Brown of Priest Hill, who was taken out of his house in front of his wife and children and shot through the head by, by Claverhouse. Or 18-year-old Margaret Wilson and 60-year-old Margaret McLaughlin, who were tied to stakes at low tide in the Solway and drowned. And there's many more um, um, accounts of men, women and young people suffering at the hands of Claverhouse and the other persecutors. Simply being at a conventicle at this time was, was enough to, to, to have you killed and carrying a Bible as well could lead to your death. Now there was an attempt to overthrow James VII by the son of the first Covenanter martyr at the Restoration, Archibald Campbell, who was the Marquis of Argyll. Now his son, the, the Earl of Argyll, also named, who was, uh, also named Archibald, tried to start a rebellion in Scotland to coincide with 
the Duke of Monmouth's rising in England. Um, however, it never really got off the ground and it was more political than, than religious, which is one of the, the, the reasons why the Covenanters never really got behind it. He was captured and beheaded on the Maiden in Edinburgh, in the guillotine, just as his father had been um, in 1661 at the return of Charles II at the Restoration. And ironically, it wasn't because of, of this rebellion that he, he was executed. It was because when he had taken the Test Act in 1681, he said he took it with reservation. But anyway, in, in anticipation of his rebellion, many of the Covenanters were taken from the prisons in the south of Scotland and moved to the to the cramped vault of, of Donota Castle, many dying on the journey, many dying in the vault. After a short while, they were banished to North America and many of them died en route as well. But through all this persecution, the Covenanters carried on with their conventicles and James Rennick carried on the work and the duties of a faithful minister, preaching, performing marriages, baptising children, and it's estimated that he baptised around 600 children during this period. He had been joined um, for a short while by the, the elderly Reverend Alexander Peden, who had returned to Scotland in 1685. He had been in Ireland for the past few years. But Peden, uh, Peden preached his last sermon in Scotland and died in uh, January of 1686. And despite being dead for six weeks when the, the, the troops found out about it, they went and dug his corpse up and hung it on the gallows at Cumnock. But change was coming. Many of the pe people that James was alienating thought that, that James VII's promotion of Catholicism was just a temporary situation given that his eldest daughter and future heiress, Mary, was Protestant and married to, Dutch, uh, to the Dutch Prince William of Orange. But in June 1688, James uh, VII's second wife, Mary, um, of Mary of Modena gives birth to a son, James Francis Edward. Now, with a Roman Catholic son set to take the throne after James the Seventh, instead of his Protestant daughter Mary, there was widespread alarm throughout Britain, and a group of leading men in England wrote to to William of Orange, um, inviting him and Mary to come and take the throne. So, in November 1688, William lands with an army in the south of England, and James's army. Um, who had alienated quite a lot of them, deserted him and caused him to panic and just flee. Uh, he actually goes to France. So in February of 1689, Parliament declares the throne vacant and William and Mary are crowned joint monarchs of England in February of 1689. Two months later, in April, they're made joint monarchs of Scotland uh, as well. And with that, 28 years of the persecution of the Covenanters in Scotland ends. Sadly, James Rennick doesn't see it. He had been arrested at the beginning of 1688 and martyred in Edinburgh. James VII still had some supporters in Scotland, however. Um, th these were known as, as Jacobites, that from the, the Latin name for James, Jacobus. So these Jacobites um, were still there, and the most important of them was Claverhouse. Claverhouse had left the south, went up to the Highlands, tried to rally the Highland clans, in an attempt to, to, to get them to fight for James. Now, after a while, Claverhouse and this Highland army march south and they meet King William's troops at the Pass of Kelly Cranky on the 27th of July, 1689, and a battle ensues. Now, the Highlanders are victorious at this battle, but Claverhouse is killed. Three weeks later, at Dunkeld, um, this Highland army meets a newly formed Cameronian regiment um, this this regiment had been um, drawn, the men were drawn from the ranks of the Covenanters um, and took their name from, from the Reverend Richard Cameron. And despite being vastly outnumbered, the Cameronians were victorious. They fought bravely. James VII and his Irish Jacobites were eventually defeated as well at the Battle of the Boyne in Ireland in 1690. So in 1690, the Church of Scotland is reorganised as Presbyterian once again. But for many of the Covenanters, this Revolution Church um, is, is not the same church as it was before the persecution. OK, it's Presbyterian, but they feel it's a more watered, watered down version of Presbyterianism. So as a result, many Covenanters actually refused to join this new church. And despite um, having no ministers, they had three 
but those three ministers uh, uh, left, Lynn, Shields and Boyd, left and joined the Church of Scotland. Um, so despite having no ministers, they still gathered together in their societies. And it wasn't until 1706 that a man called the Reverend John Macmillan left and became the, the minister to these societies. So that's Scotland's Reformation. Um, it's, it's a long Reformation. 1528, the first martyr, Patrick Hamilton, right through to 1688, um, with um, William of Orange and the Glorious Revolution. Uh, so, thanks for watching. I hope these videos have been beneficial to you. Uh, please continue to, to, to learn more and uh, read more about the, the Reformation and the Covenanters. So, thanks again. Take care.